Good morning, friends. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I'm Latia, one of your pastors at Bel Air United Methodist Church. Welcome to online worship. All this past week has been topsy-turvy for us. And you see, school started. It's virtual. But just when we were getting the hang of things, a hurricane rolled into the Gulf and all that uncertainty just amped up a notch. We thank God, though, that we are safe and we pray that you are as well. Will you let us know in the comments section, greet one another in the name of the Lord. It's our exchange of peace, but let us know how you're doing. And if you're watching on a smart TV and you're not able to make a comment, send us an email at pastor at and we would love to know how you're doing and what's on your mind. Now, a few weeks ago, we started a new thing. It's not really new. It's just another way that God has blessed us to make something old new again. We now have a digital connect card. It's much like the card that you would fill out in person. It's a way for us to know that you're here, but also for us to find out what's on your heart. If there's someone that you want us to pray for, maybe that someone is you. We want to know and we want to be in connection and in prayer for you and with you. So make sure you fill out that digital connect card. And while you're at it, if you were impacted by the rains and winds during this hurricane in the middle of a pandemic and you need some help, maybe some, some support, pastoral care, or even some direction on what your next steps might be, let us know on that Digital Connect card. We want to support you as best we can during this time in partnership with some of the ministries and organizations with the church. You can email us again at pastor at belarumc.org or just put it right there in the digital connect card. We really do hope to hear from you. Know that we do want to be in connection with you and we want to be in prayer with you just as we would if we were worshiping together in person. And friends, if it's your first time worshiping with us online, welcome. We are so glad that you're here. And I wish I could see your smiling faces in person. But since we can't, just send me a hi, Latia, in the comments. Or make sure that you fill out that Connect card. Or even send me a direct message. I want to hear from you. I want to help you grow in your ministry, in your faith, in your relationship with God. And we all do here at BUMC. We're thankful for you and we're glad you're here. Now in a moment, we'll join together in reading our call to worship, singing praises to God, and offering prayers and reading scriptures. You can follow along with the words on the screen, but we'll also have the liturgy available in a digital worship guide that you can find online at belairumc.org slash stay connected. There you'll find all sorts of ways to stay connected with us, including service opportunities and children's activities. So friends, I'm so glad you're all with us this morning. And I thank God for each and every one of you as you worship God with us at BUMC Online. We're continuing our Wonderland Sermon Series, and we hope that you'll know that God is with us, even in the wilderness experience of a pandemic, hurricanes, politics, and growing pains in race relations. As I said earlier, it's all topsy-turvy, but God is steady and his steadfast love endures forever. Therefore, let us worship God together. Will you join me in reading our call to worship? The words will be on the screen and also available in the digital worship guide. Your parts will be in bold. Let us read. Sing glad songs of victory. God is creating a day of newness. God is our strength and our song. This is the day of our salvation. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Christ is alive and assures us we are accepted and beloved by God. We are chosen by God as witnesses to good news. We live and recount the deeds of our God. God reigns. Let everyone rejoice in Christ. All shall be made alive. Friends, welcome to worship. Let us sing together.
The scriptures invite us to come out of the shadows where we have tried to hide everything that's not right in our lives. And when we show ourselves fully to God, we are reminded that God never forgets us, just like a mother never forgets her child. And when we turn to God, we find forgiveness, both for the things we have done and for the things we've left undone. So. Would you join me in this prayer of confession? The words will be on your screen. God of grace, we confess that we have not fulfilled the trust you have given us as servants of Christ and stewards of your mysteries. Our possessions have become more important to us than your approval. We worry a lot rather than trusting you and seeking to be good citizens of your kingdom. So we ask you to forgive us and to draw us back to yourself. Free us from false gods that enslave us and from limited visions that prevent us from fully following you. Amen. Hear the good news. Every day with God is a day of salvation. God leads us by springs of water to quench our thirst and meets our hunger with the nourishment we need. God offers comfort and compassion along with a challenge to grow spiritually. So give thanks for God's healing grace and know that in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God, amen. You know, it's blessing of the backpacks today and it is one of my very favorite days of the year because in a normal year, there would be dozens of people gathered all around up here at the front of the sanctuary and the kids would all have their backpacks and we'd pray together and we'd be so excited to start the new school year. Well, it's not a normal year. We can't do that today. But that doesn't mean that we can't mark this day, this time in a meaningful way. I don't have a backpack, but this is the bag that I use for work. Uh, it's got my Bible, and it's got my journal, and it's got my planner, and it's got my computer. And I feel kind of like Mr. Rogers right now, but this is, this is all the stuff that I use every single day. 
if you're headed back to school and maybe you've already started, maybe you're going to start soon, I, I want you to go and get the things that you use every day if you can. If that's uh, a Bible, well, yes, go get a Bible, uh, but your backpack, your school bag, your computer, your laptop, whatever it is that you're going to use every day. I want you to go get those things if you can. If they're not close by, just pause the service, go get them quickly, and then gather back around your screen. Do that now. Go get your backpack, your school books if you've got them. Uh, if you're doing lots of stuff online, get your computer, your laptop, your tablet, whatever. And if you're not going back to school, or if there's no one in your house who's going back to school, I want you to think about those people who are students, teachers, administrators, everybody who's doing everything they can to make education happen this year. It's not going to be easy. It'll be, bring all sorts of new challenges, um, but I think that everybody is going to give it their best. Okay, so everybody who's headed back to school, as a student, as a teacher, as an administrator, uh, whoever, this part is for you. And you've got a response that you're going to say out loud wherever you are today. Your response is easy and it's short. It goes like this, Jesus is with me. That's the thing that's true all the time, no matter what. Jesus is with me. And that's the thing I want you to say every time I point at you. Jesus is with me. So here we go. When it's the night before school and I'm excited or nervous or grumpy or however I'm feeling, Jesus is with me. When I wake up in the morning and I'm ready or I'm not ready, Jesus is with me. When I'm having trouble with online school and I can't log in and nothing's working right, Jesus is with me. When I meet my new teachers and new classmates and really hope that they like me, Jesus is with me. When I'm tired of school, when I'm tired of screens, Jesus is with me. When I'm worried or nervous or just feeling shy, Jesus is with me. When the day is done and I'm ready for rest, Jesus is with me. I'm so glad that you're headed back to school and I'm so excited to share this time with you, this time of blessing. So would you please bow your heads with me and we'll pray. Gracious God, we pray for every student, teacher, administrator, school staff person or volunteer who has or will begin this new school year. God, pour out your blessing on them as they commit themselves to study, to learn, to teach, to lead. May your spirit grant them gifts of wisdom and understanding and gifts of love for everyone they meet, patience for each new challenge, peace for every difficult time, joy in their work and in their relationships, and kindness in all their actions. And God, we ask your blessing on all the backpacks, devices, books that we've brought today. May they be perpetual reminders of the loving presence of Jesus in our lives and the love and care of the church. May all our students, teachers, administrators, and staff members be sustained by your blessing. God, we pray this in the name of Jesus, who is with us right now and every day. And all God's people said, Amen. Good morning, church family. We're the Crabtrees, and we're so glad to worship you, with you from home this morning. Hear these words from Matthew chapter 6. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? 
Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Now let's pray. Amazing God, attentive to all of creation, so that the birds are fed and the lilies of the field are clothed in splendor. We pray that you would attend to the needs of your people gathered here. Free, free us from burdens that we should not be trying to carry. Enlist us in the causes you want us to champion so that the mysteries of your love might be shared with the world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us now continue in a spirit of prayer as we cast our cares to the Lord, praying for the concerns of the world and for our community. When we finish, we'll join together in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Holy and faithful God, we give you thanks and praise for this day that you have made. And no matter what storms may rage or billows roll, we thank you for this day because your holy, holy word reminds us to rejoice and be glad in it. God, we thank you that you care for us with tender mercy and loving kindness. We thank you that you give us grace to love you in return and to love our neighbors as you command us to do. We couldn't do it without your help, without your grace. With so much temptation to be self-centered and divided, you are able to shake us up and draw us close. As we draw closer to you, we will trust you to help us to draw closer and move more lovingly toward one another, to your people the world over. For all who grieve the loss of a loved one, a friend or even an associate or a mentor, we pray for comfort, for peace and support. We pray with love for the sick and those who are suffering with illness and disease. We courageously pray for healing and restoration. Give us hope to trust you as we go through whatever ails us. Give each and every healthcare worker a special measure of grace that they may pour out your love and grace to their patients and care seekers in beautiful ways as they fulfill their duties and their vocation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also pray with hope for our city, our region, and all who are beyond our reach affected during this hurricane season, particularly this week. Lord, people are still recovering from hurricanes from years past. We pray for those who were deeply devastated by the storms and those only mildly touched by its effects. We pray for them and everyone in between who are in need of support, recovery, and resources. Many are in need of a helping hand. So we pray that you would bless the work of those hands that will come to serve and to help, that all they do may be done in love and grace. We ask for a special blessing of safety and endurance for response and recovery teams. Guard their hearts from the heaviness of the work that they may bring hope and grace and love and light, even in the darkest places that they have to travel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our community leaders and government leaders and those who hope to lead. Bless them to be the leaders you have called them to be, that their communities and constituents need them to be for the greater good. Bless them to strive to be the kind of leaders that our children and the next generation will look up to one day and aspire to be like. May we all strive for unity and above all fairness and ethics in all we do. Lord, your word reminds us to be shrewd yet gentle to follow the lead of Christ who came to preach good news to the poor, bring release and relief to the oppressed. Give us courage as you give us grace to do your will and follow you. Let our path become your path each and every day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, path, our prayer. God, we ask that you would be our divine GPS 
So redirect us every time we go astray. We will trust in you and not our own selves. For you, Lord, are worthy of our worship, of our praise, and our trust. We pray all this in the name of Jesus who taught his disciples to pray. So let us now pray that prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, when we pray together, we are together, one in the spirit. So I thank you for praying with me. Praying is just one of the ways we worship God. We worship through praying, through reading, through singing, and we worship God also through our financial giving. The Bible shows us many ways that people have given in the Old Testament and the New Testament, given a tithe, 10% of their harvest or their earnings in obedience to God. In these tumultuous times, sometimes it may seem more challenging to continue this tradition, but I pray that we can all trust God through these tough times and continue to give to the Lord through this church for the work of ministry. Ministry is still happening at BUMC and we couldn't do it without you. So we thank you with our whole hearts. Thank you. There are three ways that you can give. You can write a check, mail it to the church. The address is on the screen. You can also give by texting the word give to the number on the screen. And finally, you can go online to belairumc.org slash give to set up online giving. It's all very simple. So however you do it, know that you do make a difference and that we appreciate you very, very much. Let us pray. God of grace and compassion, you are the one who provides. As we offer these tithes and offerings this morning, we remember how you provided water from a rock, manna in the wilderness, and even oil and jars to the widow who had nothing, so that all of these would have nothing to worry about. You gave enough to meet the needs of the day and instructed them to look out for the weak and the needy. Help us then to do likewise. For what you have given us by your goodness, we thank you and we give you praise. Bless the gifts and the givers and bless this church to do your work for your kingdom. In Christ's holy name, amen. Great is 
is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Let's pray. God of love, we know that you are with us right now. And we pray that your spirit will move within us to open us up, to open our ears and our eyes, our hearts and our minds, so that we might hear a word from you. And God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all of our hearts will be acceptable and pleasing to you, God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There's this book that I love reading to our kids. They're both almost too old for it now, but it's called We're Going on a Bear Hunt. In the book, there's this family that is, you guessed it, going on a bear hunt. It starts like this. We're going on a bear hunt. We're going to catch a big one. What a beautiful day. We're not scared. But along the journey, they encounter obstacle after obstacle. First, it's a meadow with long, wavy grass. Then it's a river, a, a deep, cold river. Then mud, thick, oozy mud. And it goes on and on. And with each obstacle they encounter, they say the same thing. We can't go over it. We can't go under it. We've got to go through it. So it is with the wilderness. That's what we've been talking about for these past few weeks, the wilderness, both as an ecosystem in the land of Israel, but also as a season of life, a season when things are hard, when everything seems to go wrong. And it's no secret that we are in a wilderness time here in America. There's a pandemic. The economy is in tatters. People are struggling. There's a racial awakening and reckoning. There's political fighting to the nth degree and storms moving through the Gulf, making everything worse. And what we discover once again is what's always been true about suffering. You can't go over it. You can't go under it. You've got to go through it. Over the next two weeks, we're going to be wrapping up our Wonderland series, reading two more wilderness stories. This morning, we've got another story from David in the wilderness. It's in the time before David becomes king. Saul is still king of Israel, but, but Saul knew. Saul knew that David was God's chosen one, that David was God's anointed one. Saul knew that David would eventually take over the throne of Israel. And Saul was full of resentment and jealousy. And Saul tried to take David's life several times over several years. In response, David chose finally not to fight, but to flee, to flee deep into the wilderness. And what he discovers is what we're talking about this morning. There are no shortcuts in the wilderness. You can't go over it. You can't go under it. You've got to go through it. 
Our story is from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 24. If you've got a Bible with you, I encourage you to read along. We're going to start in verse 1. Likewise, if you've downloaded this morning's digital worship guide, you can find it there and you can read along with me. Here it is from 1 Samuel, chapter 24. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to look for David and his men in the direction of the rocks of the wild goats. That's the same place, the place called En Gedi. He, Saul, came to the sheepfolds beside the road where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of that cave. Now let's pause right there for a second. Imagine the scene. David and the handful of men with him are on the run. They're hiding from King Saul in the wilderness at a place called En Gedi. And the reason they're hiding at En Gedi is that there's water there. En means spring. There's fresh water, but there are also steep cliffs and lots of caves, hundreds and hundreds of caves to hide in. And the cave that they are hiding in just happens to be the cave that Saul wanders into when nature calls. I don't think it's an accident. It's a divinely appointed encounter. Uh, God intended for them to meet there. And here's what happens next. The men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. In other words, now's your chance. This guy's been hunting you for years. Now the tables have turned. Strike him down and the kingdom is yours, just like God promised. And then finally, they think, finally, we can stop running through this wilderness. Now's his chance. So what's David going to do? Here's what it says. Then David went. This is the end of verse 4. Then David went and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's cloak. Just a little piece of fabric. He didn't harm a hair on Saul's head. And afterwards, David was stricken to the heart because he had cut off a corner of Saul's cloak. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to raise my hand against him, for he, Saul, is the Lord's anointed. So David scolded his men severely and did not permit them to attack Saul. Then Saul got up and left the cave and went on his way. What are we supposed to make of this? Did David lack the courage or the skill to strike Saul? No. David was an incredibly accomplished soldier. Did he suddenly get squeamish thinking of the sight of blood? I doubt it. This is the same guy who cut off the head of Goliath. No, I think what we're supposed to see here is that the wilderness has been working on David. I said a couple of weeks ago that time in the wilderness is not wasted time because the wilderness can change us. It can change us for the better. In the Bible, stories of wilderness have a very clear function to humble, to test, and to teach. And that's what the wilderness has done to David. It worked on him because the wilderness has humbled David, has shown him that he is not God, that he cannot provide everything he needs all on his own. The wilderness has tested him too. The wilderness has made him answer God's question, will you trust me? Will you trust me here when the necessities of life are not in view? Will you trust me here when things are harder than you ever thought they would be? Will you trust me here? And the wilderness has taught David. It taught David that he could rely on God for everything he needed. It taught David that God was capable and caring and reliable, that God was enough. So in the end, the wilderness wasn't just a place for David to hide out and survive. The wilderness was also a place for David to mature into the kind of leader the Lord wanted for his people, a leader after God's own heart. There in the cave, inches away from Saul, David knew that he was the Lord's anointed. David knew that he would one day be king. But he also knew that there was a lot he didn't know. God hadn't told David 
when he would become king. God hadn't told David how Saul would lose the throne. David's men were anxious to fill in the gaps. Now's your chance. They saw an opportunity to take a shortcut out of the wilderness, to fast forward to the very end, to strike down Saul and end their time on the run, to get on with the God-given work of leading Israel. David, I'm sure, was tired of the wilderness. But instead of trying to fill in all the unanswered gaps, instead of trying to shortcut his way and fast forward to the end, David approached the opportunity through the lens of the question that God always asks, will you trust me here, now? I've maybe mentioned this before, but we've been watching a lot of kids' movies lately. Frozen 2 has become a favorite in our house. If you haven't seen it, you should, and you'll be singing along soon. Uh, There's one song in the movie, Anna and Elsa, sisters are separated, and it's a dark moment in the movie. Anna is worried. She's afraid because she knows, she just knows that something terrible has happened to her sister. It's a wilderness moment in the movie. And the way she starts the song makes clear just how barren this wilderness is. Here's what she says. I've seen dark before, but not like this. This is cold. This is empty. This is numb. The life I knew is over. The lights are out. Hello, darkness. I'm ready to succumb. As the first verse crescendos, she sings with a tremor in her voice. You are lost, hope is gone, but you must go on and do the next right thing. And as the song goes on, she names over and over the harsh realities of walking a wilderness road, but she always comes back to, just do the next right thing. Take a step, step again. It is all that I can to do the next right thing. This is what David is doing in the cave with Saul. David doesn't know exactly how the future is going to unfold, but what David knows is that everything, everything is in God's hands. God's hands, not his. David knows that he can rely on God for everything he needs. David knows that he can trust God even here, even now. So all he needs to do is the next right thing. For us, we don't know what the future holds. We don't know how this week or this month or this year will unfold. We don't know when this wilderness will end. But our time in the wilderness has shaped us, hasn't it? Because now, more than before, we know that the world is in God's hands, not ours. We know that God will provide everything we need And we know it in a brand new way, don't we? We know more than we did before that we can trust God right here, right now. So all we need to do is the next right thing. And you know, people have been asking me, what's the plan? What's the plan, Sean? What are are you going to do? And they're talking about church and they're talking about home. What are are you going to do about school for the fall? What are you going to do for worship? And to be honest, the question has overwhelmed me. Because I feel like I can't reliably plan for even two weeks at a time. So, so what are we supposed to do? Well, it finally hit me this week. You're supposed to do the next right thing. And that's what we're going to try to do here at the church. It's hard to know what the future holds. So each day, each and every day, we're going to do the next right thing. As we figure out how to live and to do ministry in a world where coronavirus is an ongoing reality, we're going to take a step, step again. And if we make mistakes, we'll learn from them, and then we'll, we'll take another step and another step. And as best we can, each day we'll do the next right thing. That's what I want you to hear this morning. If you're a parent who's about to send your kids back to school, you don't need to have it all figured out. 
You don't need to have it all planned out. You don't even need to know what tomorrow looks like. Just do the next right thing. If you're lonely or bored or really feeling the weight of isolation, you don't need to snap out of it. You don't need to fix it all right now. Just do the next right thing. We are still walking through the wilderness. We can't go over it. We can't go under it. We've got to go through it. So take a step and step again. Do the next right thing. Let's pray. God of glory, we know that you walk with us, ahead of us and behind us. So we pray that with every step we take, we will remember that you are capable, that you are caring, that you are reliable, that you will provide everything we need, and that we can trust you right here, right now. Guide our steps, Lord so that as we walk into the future you have prepared, we will each day do the next right thing. Amen. Let's sing. Faithful
friends, what a joy it has been to worship God together this morning. I'm so glad that you were here. Don't forget to fill out your digital connect card. The link to it is in the chat here on Facebook or on YouTube. And if you can come this afternoon, drive through our on-site blessing of the backpacks. It's from four o'clock to five o'clock PM. We've got care packages for students and teachers, uh, but we wanna see everybody who can come. Whether you're headed back to school or not, you'll stay in your car, we'll have masks on, and it will be so good, so good to see your faces and hear your voices. So come if you can, four o'clock to five o'clock this afternoon, enter by the East parking lot off of Bel Air Boulevard and take the driveway that goes down past the Family Life Center and toward the playground. I can't wait to see you if you can come. Now, go in peace to serve God and your neighbor in all that you do. And may the peace of Christ go with you. Amen. Thank you.